Yes, now. Yes, hello, hello. Hi, everyone. Hi, Andres, Dimit, Jarudi. Hi, hi, everyone. How's everyone doing? Ah, Woo. sorry for the. Okay, so wait, 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 wait. Am I ready for this? Is the green screen. Did I tell you folks that I broke the green screen? You know, <laughs> I started pulling one day and I just tore a chunk open. Good thing I had green masking tape that I could use to fix it. <laughs> hey, Albert. Hola. Um, all right. What? Well, hold on, hold on. First things first. Hello. This is Jose Luis here, Parametric Camp. Computational design, live streams mostly every Friday. Um, we record tutorials here live in the beautiful company of the Parametric Campers. And um, oh, my God, it's hurting me. And we then edit them, we publish them as videos, a bit more polished, not a lot more polished, but <laughs> a little more structured, let's say. If you want to follow us, they'll have social media, particularly active in Instagram. We also have a Discord server. You're welcome to join that for offline conversations, Q&A, code questions. There's a lot of people who um, volunteer some of their time to helping other people with their code questions. Uh, meet the meet. I see you have some questions down there. You're welcome to join Discord and uh, and ask and. Hey, no, no, how are you doing? Uh, what's up? So we're very good to see you. And if you, there's a link to the Discord server in the description of this video. And there's also a link to a Google Calendar that you can subscribe to if you want to know when we go live. We just post the event on the Google Calendar and you can see it on your Google Calendar. I think that's how it works. So, um, all right, what are we doing today? If you were here, on our live on our last live stream you're probably familiar with the you probably know that it was a little bumpy <laughs> i uh, ran into a bunch of issues while i was trying to do things etc and we couldn't figure it out but thanks to victor's help actually we managed to figure out the solution so what i'm going to do today is i'm going to record those videos in a more formal way and what we're going to be doing is if you remember we are right now in the middle of this experimental playlist that so that we're doing, which is I want to publish a Grasshopper plugin for AI and machine learning, specifically for accessing APIs that uh, live out there in the wild that we can use to uh, request AI and machine learning services. For example, the most popular one these days is probably OpenAI with ChatGPT, DALI, etc., etc. But there are some others that we can also use as a service. Okay, so it's not going to be doing machine learning from scratch. It's mostly accessing these services. And one of the most common ways to access these services is through what's called REST APIs, or in other words, making calls with HTTP verbs to, uh, to some endpoints, some URLs, and sending some information about the requests that we want, right? So we started off the plugin by <clears throat> writing generic calls. So in this case, HTTP post requests are the most common ones when it comes to doing these APIs. And in previous videos, we've done already a regular HTTP POST request, which, and the problem was that uh, because it's something that goes through the internet and it lands on a server and the server needs to process and then it gives you a response back, it takes quite some time. It can take several seconds. Like for example, I think the average for me was about 10 seconds. And if you do in regular Grasshopper, if you do this call with a component, the 10 seconds that the component is waiting for the response will actually be 10 seconds where your entire grasshopper is frozen. You can't do anything. So, so we thought that perhaps creating a component that does this request, but does it asynchronously could be interesting because it basically lets us, lets us, um, lets us uh, calcu um, calculate now. Let's calculate. It lets us just keep interacting with Grasshopper and change things, and we can see 
how things are going. So we were trying to implement, to write the same HTTP post request, but instead of in a synchronous manner, switch to asynchronous. We ran into a few problems because I wanted, uh, I don't know if you remember, we did, let me share my screen here. Where is my screen? Um, where am I? Yeah. So we did back in the times, and no, no, you are not going to believe this. I'm still not using the Stream Deck. <laughs> I still haven't unboxed it. You're going to kill me for that. I also have the new Elgato webcam. I also still haven't unboxed it. Uh, my, life is, my life is a mess these days. But if you remember, we, we did a video. I know, I know I am the worst. <laughs> we did a video where we did asynchronous components, but in order to do it, we actually relied on this Grasshopper component template that the folks at Speckle, where is the Speckle? That the folks at Speckle had created, which is very nice. But Victor, one of the parametric campers, he proposed to try to do like a raw version of this, which I thought was interesting because it could help us learn more about the Grasshopper update cycle. We ran into a bunch of issues. Uh, we couldn't finish that in the last live stream, and that's what I would like to finish today. I know, I know. Maybe I should just do like one stream where it's all about unboxing the stream deck and unboxing the, uh, <laughs> the camera, etc., etc. So what I would like to do in this live stream is I would like to record a video where we write a where we write a a an asynchronous component from scratch and so and that's probably going to go to the playlist this playlist the playlist where we had the advanced development this and it might be a video that we just add here at the very end asynchronous components and we switch we switch this to with speckle and then uh, we add another video asynchronous components from scratch or something like that right i would like to do that and then once we have that we can go back to the other playlist which i believe you still cannot see where is it uh why is it not here because i guess it's not public yet and i guess th there is another playlist that i just started recently which is ai machine learning plugin whatever and then we will make in the other playlist we will make a video where we will actually write the http post request asynchronously using what we've learned from that video. So it's going to be a little bit of a crossover. If I manage to make those two videos today, I would be super happy. Okay. And you can see, uh, you can see this, this thing here. Can you see this tiny? That's the, <laughs> that's the green tape I had to put because I, you know, you see how I pull from here? That's the green tape I had to put on my green skin, on my green screen after I broke it. Um, Chandra, hello, Will, good to see you. What's up? So in order to do that, what are we going to do? The first thing I would like to do is I would like to prototype the thing here uh, so that I have my cheat sheet and I can follow that. And then we're going to, um, we're going to record the video for the asynchronous component from scratch. And then we're going to go back to the other playlist and record the other video. Okay, so let's do that. So I want to throw Victor under the bus. Where is he? Uh, yes. So he actually recently shared with me this component, this, um, this uh, notes that he wrote for himself, where he basically breaks down the update cycle and uh, expiration cycles of Grasshopper components. This is part of his own research, part uh, a little bit of what we found through this experiment that we run. I'm going to copy this right now here on the chat. I believe you can see it, correct? There's a tiny non-chroma background. Yeah, that, that is that thing, correct? That's what I was saying. This is... Um, this is um, this is like I broke, I tore the green screen the other day, and I had to use green tape, and it's not great. I had to I had to get I had to get a new screen. I just I literally just broke it. Yeah, 
Um, I, uh, I tried to figure out my questions in ChatGPT a lot of time in different language Python. Yeah, I know. ChatGPT is it's good if you know already what you're doing. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to the plugin that we were doing. So that's going to be what? Parametrical, uh, but no, parametrical GitHub. So we have what? Advanced development, PTEM Grasshopper plugin. So that's going to be it. Mm -hmm. And then we have what? Library info distribution. Tools for Rhino package manager. What data component? Asynchronous for loop component. Exactly. So this one was the asynchronous grasshopper component that we did that we had from the speckle from the speckle template. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to rename this speckle and this is going to be also speckle, right? Um, using the speckle template. All right, so that's gonna, we're gonna leave that there. A sync for look and we're gonna rename this speckle Okay, and that's going to be this. So we're going to rename this. And then I want to create a new one. So that's going to be a new one we're going to be using and I will go over all of this. Uh, once we record the video more form a sync for loop row component. Uh, and actually, I'm not going to call this row. I'm just going to call it. You know what I, I also forgot to <laughs> and so this would be speckle. I also forgot to use the template. So, so an add new item. I'm going to find the grasshopper component. And this is going to be async for loop uh, component. Okay. Um, so we're using this here and then, so let me prototype this real quick. A sync for loop component, a sync for loop. And so this is going to be a sync for loop, a sync for loop. I actually, the fact that we don't have, yeah, I guess iterations. Yes. So character description is going to be an a sync for loop. And the category is going to be PCAMP and the category is, subcategory is going to be async. I'm going to add the same parameters, so number of iterations here. And then the, this is going to be whatever, the message. All right. And then the solve instance, we don't have it here because it was part of the template. And then we had this, all this other stuff, the for loop worker, et cetera, et cetera. Yes. Okay. So for the eye, for the bitmap, for the icon, I'm going to add the parametric camp exactly. And then here, what we will need to do is in the instance, we will need to, um, to add. So then we now take a look at what we did for the other component. So what was, um, I guess, tutorial, brain, source, okay. All right. And then, yes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a variable, a class variable called output result, and I'm going to lowercase that and to indicate this a private it's a private something that should not be accessed by anyone uh, anywhere else and then so what we're going to do is 
We're also going to add a private value. In this case, it's going to be a string, uh, and this is going to be called the output message. And this is going to be empty right now. So what I'm going to do is, for the solving of the instance, if Mm -hmm. For solving the instance, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say if output result, no, wait, 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 output, all right, I'm going to rename this to should, should output, okay, and then I'm going to rename this to message, for example. Um, message, okay. Message, and then so if here, if we should output, then what we need to do is we need to say da dot set data at zero and just do message, okay, and then stop here. Um, otherwise, if we don't if we shouldn't output, then we need to do calculations. So we need to do, for example, int it's is going to be zero da dot and if da dot get data zero reference it's. I'm just prototyping this right now to make sure that it works. Okay, otherwise, and then. I will explain why I'm doing this in the video. All right. Um, and oh, by the way, I forgot this. Should output should be false. Okay, should be set to false. And then here, and then if we execute this, then Mm-hmm. All right. So if we want to execute this, then what we should do is we should say after this we should output and then we should expire the solution and then we should execute some kind of function that is the one that is going to be doing the actual um, asynchronous calculation. Okay, so for example, I'm going to say async cal calculation. All right, and that doesn't exist, but I'm going to do it here, for example, and that's going to be a private void async calculation. And uh, we probably want the, the value Okay, so in iterations, so we have that. Mm -hmm. And then here we're going to perform some kind of asynchronous task. So what that we're going to do is we're going to write here, if this is executed, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, well, we could do it here as well. Should output equals true. Hmm. Is that what I'm doing? And I, I don't think I should have this here. Exactly. I don't think I should have that there. Asynchronous calculation, we do it, do it, and then we say, well, let me take task and let me just run a task, which is going to be, I'm going to create an anonymous function here, and then I should close that up, and then the task is going to be just like a for loop with for in i equals zero, i is less than iterations, i plus plus, and then just do something, I don't know, for example, uh, int 
it's it's equal to zero and then it's i'm going to add one value there for example and then once this is done what we want to do is we want to expire the solution and after expiring the solution what we want to do is we want to expire here uh, override um, expire downstream objects and then if should output then we expire this I know this is a lot and it's complicated and I have not <laughs> but I will explain uh, in a second what this means okay don't worry can I also just A delegate method. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's see if this works. So if I run this, um, is this going to work? Mm -hmm. Parametric cam components, development, up. Oh. Now, okay. I didn't seem to find these files. I wonder if I moved them somewhere. Test. Yes. I. No. I tutorial files. Camp. Sample files. I probably. Yeah, this path probably doesn't exist. Parameter camp components. Huh? What? I guess I'm not, I guess I'm not loading the folder. Oh boy. Uh -uh. I think I blocked. Okay. So grass, so grasshopper folders, no. grasshopper developer settings. Yes, it can find the folder with the parametric camp. So I guess I just, uh, I think I may have moved this somewhere. So let me find where do I have this. So code parametric cam tutorial files. Oh my God, this is a lot advanced parametric cam plugin binaries and debug net forty eight. I guess it's going to be right. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So net 48. So I'm going to then close this. And I'm assuming my files are not updated. I may have changed this. So where do I have? Okay, so let me open Visual Studio Code. And let me open Visual Studio Code again. <laughs> And then here in the project, I probably want to update this. Yes, I probably need to update this. Yes, so that it triggers and opens my file correctly. So I'm going to do this again. Don't worry, folks. I'm going to, about to explain what I just did. All right, so this is working. And if I go to parametric camp asynchronous, so this is speckle. No, asynchronous forward loop. And this is asynchronous forward loop speckle. All right, so this one is one that up, oh, it's calculating, it's calculating, I guess. Is not giving us a lot of feedback. Mm. Oh, because I didn't do anything about the message. Yeah. Very bad. 
Yes, so, and then after this, the message is going to be done with it, iterations, iter, it, iterations, done with this many iterations. Okay, so let me try again, because I think the auto, the hot reload should have taken care of updating that. So let me see if we get, so I get this done with these many iterations. And I wonder what I did here that is so heavy, <laughs> uh, so that we can also do that. Spec a component, request cancellation, cancel for uh, result equal one, final results. Um, uh, and then cancellation token do work, number of iterations, cancellation result is one, report progress. I guess what's expensive is the progress. Uh, so let me just do, uh, so let me just do some expensive calculation here. So double expensive is going to be equal to math as square root, math of the square root, math of the square root and math of the square root of i. <laughs> so let's, that probably should give it some, some more hefty. So asynchronous for loop. So calculating, yes. And then if I do this, it takes, yes, it takes a bunch of, yep, pop, pop, exactly. And what's weird, I think this one is better because it doesn't compute everything. Huh. Okay. All right. Sorry if I have to leave. Sorry if I do wrong. You're not doing wrong. What are you talking about? Uh, yeah, yeah, we're interacting here. It's, it's just that if you have more formal questions or you need code help or whatever, Discord is a better place for having like longer conversations about code, etc., etc. So don't worry about that. Okay. So I think this works. The cancellation part is better here because if we cancel, this gets canceled automatically, but this just accumulates all those. Hmm. But this is working, I guess. So what I can do is I can now copy paste here an example of this, correct? Um, and then I'm going to remove this. I'm going to remove this. <clears throat> Where were we? Sorry. This one. Why can I not remove it? Oh, because I'm still debugging. Yes. So I can delete this. And now how can I explain what are we doing here? How can we explain this in a way that makes sense for the video and is not complicated? I guess, should I bring my notes? <clears throat> what we could do is we could do some diagram where mm -hmm. we could probably do a diagram. Yes. 
Okay, I guess I'm going to <laughs> I'm going to go and set my drawing computer here so that I can make a diagram and explain the update cycle. Yes, so we're going to do that. Let me go find my laptop. I'll be right back and I'm going to send things up. I'll be right back. Give me one second. All right, I'm here. Let me make some room for the computer. Oh, what am I going to put this? <laughs> when am I going to take, when am I going to get like a decent recording studio like, like, Dan, like Dan Schiffman, you know? That would be really cool. All right, so I'm going to open this. I'm going to plug in because otherwise, if I don't, and I have my stylus here. <clears throat> and I'm going to close everything. And I'm going to, <clears throat> from my computer here, I'm going to project, where is that? I'm going to, no. I'm going to project, connect to a wireless display. Ah. Okay, too many, too many keyboards on my on here right now. Uh, connect to a wireless display. Yes. Okay, so that worked. And my computer almost blew up. And then now I have here. Is this true? Okay, do you want to Okay, sketchbook, all right. <laughs> so if I do sketchbook, do I get to draw? Yes, I get to draw on the screen. And where are the layers? Can I get to see the layer editor? Where's the layer editor? Oh, it's, it's in, in, I have four screens right now in front of me. <laughs> okay, I'm going to extend this. All right, beautiful. And the, yes, okay, so now I'm going to basically, and this is the, ah, this is the problem I'm getting, yeah. And, mm, I know, I know. I guess I'm gonna need to get another screen at this point, another green screen, okay. So, let's say I'm going to draw a grasshopper definition. I have a slider, correct, and that's connected to a component. And the component is connected to another component and another component, for example, right? Let's say that this is our grasshopper definition. And then what we can do is we can say, well, how does a grasshopper definition actually work on a step-by-step -step basis? Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, the first thing that we would do is let's say we change this and we now move it here, okay? What happens is that there is a change. There is a change in the data that is coming. There is a change in the data that is coming, change of the input, okay? The way the grasshopper deals with this is first. It decide it makes this thing called uh, it flags the component as expired 
And then what that means is that it says that this one should expire. Oops. This one should expire. And this one should expire. All right. And then after that, so actually, I think, and this one expires as well. And this one expires as well. All right. So that's what happens. Then after that, uh, the solution is created, is computed. What, what are we going to say? Um, Solve instance, 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 no, oh, instance, instance. Um, solve instance, and then once the instance is solved, then after that, the, mm, the new the data is sent the data is sent downstream so that's what happens okay so then what do we want what we want is we want the component to not expire anything downstream Solve the instance, and if something is, and if something is, and if something has changed, then that's when we expire the solution. And then, so I'm going to do that, and I'm going to explain that with the green, I think. Okay, so let me, let me try that. So where's my mouse, actually? All right, my mouse is here, here, here. All right, okay. So let me try to explain this, all right? So I guess we're starting, I guess we're starting with the video. <laughs> all right. Before we start writing any code, of course, what I would like to do is I would like to first take some time to break down in a very superficial way how the update and the execution cycle of Grasshopper works in more or less, right? And in order to do that, we need to understand that when we change data in any Grasshopper definition, there's a bunch of things, a bunch of processes that are happening in the background that take care of updating the solutions in the grasshopper components, and then broadcasting a chain of events down the graph tree of grasshopper components so that anything that depends on that obsolete data gets updated properly, all right? So I've drawn this fantastic grasshopper definition here, and I want to use this to explain more or less the way this works from a code standpoint, right? And the idea is that if, let's say we have a definition that starts with a slider, has a component, and then it has two other components that depend on the first one, what would happen if I were to change the slider is that there would be a change in the data that is flowing from the slider to the component that we are targeting, right? What happens in that component is that Grasshopper, as a computational engine, if you will, what it will do is that the first thing that it will do is that it will flag that component as expired. By expired, we mean that the data that that Grasshopper component contains is not valid anymore. Because since it has detected that the input has changed, then it knows that whatever data was there it's not valid, it's obsolete, and it needs to recompute that data. But the key here to understand is that that expiration happens 
first. It's the first thing that happens in the component. And that expiration actually broadcasts to components that are living downstream after the component that has expired. So what that means is that there's like a chain of expire, 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 and then also those components are flagged as obsolete or dirty or however you want to call them, and then they are scheduled for having their data recomputed, okay? And if you have been following this playlist, you know that recomputing that data is typically done using the function that lives in Grasshopper components that is called solve instance. Solve instance is called after the component is being flagged as expired. And then what solve instance does is it takes the new input, it looks at the input, whatever it is, this new stuff, it takes the input, it performs a calculation, and then assigns values to the output. And then those values that are assigned to the outputs will then flow down the stream into the other components, which are also expired and are also flagged to take new inputs, recompute them, create new outputs, etc., etc. Right? So this is roughly how things work. What we want to achieve, though, it's kind of a different behavior, one that Grasshopper natively does not, uh, does not provide, which is one where if we assume that the big component, the one that we're working with at the center, is going to take a long time to execute, and we don't want the component, we don't want Grasshopper to freeze, we want things to keep flowing, but we don't want the components after this one to expire or to change or to trigger any update, then what we need to do is we need to hack this process a little bit so that we control the expiration and the solving of instances in a way that suits this asynchronous or this like deferred update of the solution that we want to achieve. So how would this work? I'm going to try to now uh, make a good case as explaining this. We're going to still accept a change from upstream, we're still going to detect that the input has changed, right? But when that happens, what we want is, first of all, we don't want to expire this component right away. So we don't want to do that, okay? We don't want to do that because what we don't want is for the rest of the components downstream to be also expired and to be waiting for this solution that is going to take some time to execute. So what we're going to do is we're going to detect the change of the input and we're going to prevent this component from expiring. This component is not going to flag anything downstream as obsolete as needing more calculation. No. And then what we're going to do is we're going to still solve the component. We're going to trigger an update, a calculation. We will probably do that calculation asynchronously. So it goes somewhere on a thread somewhere in the background is going to calculate. And whenever this calculation that takes a long time gets done, what we're going to do is we're going to ask this component to trigger again. We're going to actually expire the solution so that the whole process starts again. And what will happen is that, and we're going to store the data that we have calculated, we're going to store that data somewhere special in memory so that after that long calculation has been executed and the data is available, stored somewhere in the component, what we're going to do is we're going to expire the solution so that everything triggers and everything um, starts over again. And when it starts over again, this component, at this point, we actually want it to expire. We will want that expiration so that, so that the data that we have saved we now broadcast that data all the way downstream and components that depend on this component get updated in that moment. This was a little uh, too much to say, but in a nutshell, whenever we change data in the input, what we want is to have the component not trigger any updates downstream, performs our calculation in the background, and when that calculation is done, then trigger a new update so that we start over with the whole cycle again in a normal way. We expire the solution, these things are scheduled for updating again, and we broadcast downstream all that data that we calculated in some kind of offline task or off of background thread, and then we pass that data downstream.
Okay? The way we're going to do this, again, is not in a way that is natural to Grasshopper. It, it's going to require like a little bit of hacking of the behavior of the component. Um, I'm, I believe Grasshopper 2 may have some of this logic embedded and you will be able to do this and naturally in Grasshopper 2. So if you're watching this from the future and Grasshopper 2 is available, please maybe ignore <laughs> all of this and find how this is properly done in Grasshopper 2, okay? But in, in the meantime, uh, this is one trick that we can use. And as I said previously in the introduction, this technique that I'm doing is pretty much the technique that Speckle, the template that we saw in the previous video, is actually using under the hood, all right? So, if anything, this video can be helpful for you to understand a little more of the update cycle and the execution cycle of Grasshopper components, all right? Let's take a look at how to actually write code that does this mess that I just proposed to you, all right? <laughs> let's, let's take a look at that. All right, beautiful. That was not terrible. Was that terrible? <laughs> Does anyone think it was terrible? I will be okay with you thinking that it's terrible, all right? <laughs> okay, so not here, here. All right. So we have this component. <clears throat> so this is this where I'm going to start the video. Oh, I want a component that also does messaging. We brought a video, so we probably want to do that video after this one, okay? And let me remind myself that I want to record the introduction. And let me remind myself that we want to... Yeah. Pick up notes. Yes. Uh, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. This is what I wanted to say. Yeah. All right, beautiful. So how are we going to do this code-wise? Code-wise, um, mm -mm. code what I'm going to do is I'm going to... Um, I'm going to first do an example where I don't update anything. I don't trigger any, any, I don't trigger any updates. We're going to prevent expiration. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So let's start by making the, by making the, the, the component and adding the inputs, the parameters, the message, et cetera, et cetera. And then this is the async for loop. All right. Okay. So if you remember our previous video, we had this component that basically did this very long for loop um, with the speckle template, all right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to now go here, add a new item, and I'm going to create an empty grasshopper component that I'm going to call a sync for loop component without the speckle part, all right? And I'm going to put it here side by side because I'm going to copy and paste a couple things. So for example, here, this is going to be called a synchronous for loop. This is going to be called a synchronous for loop. A synchronous for loop, the category is going to be parametric camp and the subcategory is going to be asynchronous, all right? So I don't need a base worker because I'm going to do this from scratch. So I'm going to copy and paste an input for iterations. I'm going to copy and paste an output as a message, right? And then I have salt instance. I'm going to add this placeholder icon that we've been working with just for the sake of, of it, all right? And then we do have the salt instance, um, the salt instance. All right. So I think I'm going to go full screen here now. And then the first thing, if you remember, the first thing that I want to do is, I think the first way that I'm going to prototype this is, I'm going to make sure that I create a component that have, no matter whatever changes are happening, no matter whatever changes are happening 
coming from the input, it doesn't expire anything downstream. Okay, and then after that, we will figure out how to connect everything together. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create, I'm going to go here and I'm going to override a, I'm going to override um, a, a function that exists in Grasshopper components that is called expire downstream objects. This is the function that gets called whenever a component is expired and then that handles what it does. If I leave it like this, What's going to happen is that whenever this component gets expired, it's going to call the typical behavior of grasshopper components when they get expired. So what I would like to do is, first of all, I would like to stop that behavior. So what I would like to say, do is maybe I can just cancel it. Or if I want to be a bit better, what I can do is I can create a private Boolean flag here, for example, should expire, and I'm going to call that false. And then I'm going to use this variable to control if this component at any given time creates expirations or it doesn't. So if should expire is true, then please expire the component. Otherwise, the component is going to prevent any expiration downstream. All right. So expire downstream, overwriting it. Let's see if this works. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to open Grasshopper now. I'm going to load that template file that we had with a bunch of tests, etc. right? And I'm going to try the component first. I'm going to ignore the recovery file. I don't know what that is. All right, pcam components. And it takes some time to load because I think that the definition is quite heavy at this point. Uh, all right. And you see the speckle one that we had before. All right, so I'm going to copy here. I'm going to go here. Now I have the speckle component and I have a synchronous for loop. All right. I'm going to plug this in here. All right. And then I'm going to connect this. What you can see is that this is basically, we don't see anything here, but we don't really know if this component is being updated or not. So a good way to, for doing that is I'm going to use the recorder. All right. I'm going to plug it in here. And if the component where to update, if the component was updating, then the recorder would be giving me no, 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 no. So for example, if I do this, you can see that the component is not adding empty solutions because this component is not triggering updates. On the contrary, for example, you see if I were to plug in a, the slider right away, you see that as I change values, I keep adding, adding more and more solutions because this component is being updated. All right. So I think the prevention of the expiration is already working. All right. So then how can we now do that offline background calculation that we wanted to do? Let's take a look at that. How are we going to do that? How are we going to do that? Oops. So I'm going to then just add to solve instance. I'm going to do the typical thing. We're going to take the input. We're going to uh, return if it doesn't work. And then we're going to perform the calculation. Mm -hmm. Okay. For starters, we're going to do like we typically do with any. Oh, no. Oh, boy. Was the sound weird? Ah. No, I don't want this. Yes, I want to remove that. What a mess. I had a double microphone. Uh, none of you told me that the sound was being weird. Anyway, starting over again.
For starters, we're going to do like we typically do, which is we're going to first gather the inputs. So we're going to define a variable called iterations, which starts at zero. And we're going to say if, um, if we didn't get anything from the input at location zero and that we are storing at iterations, then stop executing this component. All right. So we've seen this pattern in previous videos in this playlist, right? So, and then what we would like to do is now we would like to perform this uh, asynchronous large for loop. The way we're going to do that is that we're actually going to call some other function that is going to do the asynchronous calculation. So I'm going to say, for example, I'm going to create a private function that is going to return nothing. And I'm going to call this asynchronous for loop. And I'm going to take an amount of iterations as an input. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch in this uh, function, I'm going to launch a background thread. And that background thread is going to do some kind of heavy calculation. In C sharp, uh, we haven't seen this yet, I think in previous videos. But what you can do is you can very easily start a task that goes on a thread in the background by just saying, I'm going to run a function in the background using a task manager, right? What I can do is I can define a function here on the fly, right? So what I could do is I can say I'm going to define a an anonymous function. And that I can do by saying this anonymous function that I'm defining here on the fly is going to take no data as an input, and is going to execute this code that I have here. And the code is going to be something like this. For example, how many iterations I'm going to run is going to be zero. And then for int i equals zero, i is less than it, i t i plus plus, i plus plus. And then what we could do here is we could say iterations equals to i. Oh, and just for the sake of making sure that we see this taking time, I'm going to do some kind of expensive calculation here. All right. So I'm going to say math square root of math of the square root of math of the square root. And I could probably write a for loop for doing this, but I'm just being lazy at this point. You know, I'm going to do four nested square roots for this particular value, which I'm actually not going to use at all, just for the sake of making the this calculation a little more expensive. All right. Beautiful. So then what are we going to do? Where um, what I would like to do is somehow um, store the result of this calculation. Again, what I'm doing this here is a little abstract. But you can imagine that this could be something very heavy, or we could be doing an asynchronous call, we could be doing a post request, a get request on the internet. And actually, there will be a video somewhere in the channel where I'm using this to make a post request to an API service. If the video is already online, there will be a card popping up to this video somewhere. All right. And then what I would like to do then is I would like to store the result of this calculation somewhere. But because it is a for loop that is happening asynchronously, and that is kind of detached from the main instance here. So I could call this from a sync, I could call this a synchronous for loop. And I want this number of iterations, correct. But because this is going to be running on a separate thread, what I cannot do is I cannot return a value that I can store here. So the way to do this is actually not very complicated, which is what I can do is I can create a variable in my component that is going to be private, but it's going to be a scoped inside of the class that represents the component. And therefore, it's going to be accessible to anything that lives, executes, or is accessible from within this class. All right. So let's say that I say I'm going to create a something that is called a message, a private variable that is called a message. And I am underscoring this name just because in C sharp, it is a convention to add an underscore at the beginning of any variable that is private and is not meant to be shared or read by external processes or external classes, right. And then after the iterations are done, what I can do is I can say, message is going to be equal to completed. Uh, and then uh, iterations plus the word the actual word iterations. Okay. Beautiful. All right. 
So how is this going to work? Let me just run this code, see if this works in the definition, etc. etc. So I'm going to, this is going to open Grasshopper, okay? Uh, and something broke, it is connected context. I don't know what that means, <laughs> but Grasshopper actually did start and maybe it has something to do with Rhino and Grasshopper. I have Grasshopper on my other screen. Yes. So if I change this, this works. This, I'm assuming it's also working, but I'm not getting any feedback because remember, we had canceled the expiration of this component. No matter what changes we do to the inputs, this component is not going to let any of those changes go through. And it's also not going to create any output because we haven't created that anywhere. All right. So here's where the tricky part comes. And I want you, if you're paying attention, I want you to pay perhaps a little more attention to this. We have completed the first part, which is we change the input. We prevent the expiration. So there's no expiration. We start an instance. So we trigger solving the instance. We do this heavy operation in the background and we have some data now, which is the result of that operation. Okay. That we have stored as a private variable in our component. Now the trick is what I want is once I have that data computed, what I want to do is I want to trigger a new solution in the component so that the component now restarts, if you will, right? And then upon that restart, what I want is to change that behavior that I just implemented. I want expiration now to actually go through so that everything downstream gets triggered and updated. And I want that data that I calculated before to go downstream, to be broadcasted to anything that goes behind in the update chain. How am I going to do that? It's going to be super easy. I'm actually going to use that flag, that Boolean flag that we created before to signal on and off expiration and solution. All right. Let me show you how we're going to do that. <clears throat> if you remember, we were not expiring anything downstream because we were blocking that expiration with this one variable called should expire, which right now we initialize to false and it's always false. And that's why we're not updating anything downstream. All right. So how about this? Imagine we have our asynchronous task, right? This is the one that gets thrown into the background, running, runs in its own thread, it's doing its thing. And then at some point it finishes doing this very expensive calculation, right? When that happens, this is where we store that data that we hope to pass downstream. What we could do after that is we could say, you know what? What if once we've calculated this, we change should expire from false, we change that to true. That in itself is not really going to do anything. However, what we can do is like we can do that, but at the same time, we can force the component that we're at to update itself. All right. There are many ways to do that. For example, the typical way is to use expire solution and just say expire solution true and then trigger that. However, I'm not going to show you here, but this will not work on the on this task, which has been threaded because since it's been threaded, this expire solution does not have a reference to the thread that actually um, started the whole issue and therefore is going to create a problem. All right. So instead of doing this, the other, the recommended method, especially when you do asynchronous stuff and you, when you do different threads would be to just make sure that you capture the thread that is running the Rhino UI and that within that thread, you call the expiration of the solution. The way that is done in, in Rhino is by saying, you know what, 
can we access the Rhino app? And within the Rhino app, can I please invoke the thread that is controlling the UI? And inside of that thread, can I run a particular function that I want to run? In this case, it would be expire solution. The problem is that I cannot write expire solution here true because this invoke on UI thread, the only thing that takes as parameters, so if we look at, if we open here, you can see that the only thing that it takes is this thing called a delegate. A delegate is basically a function that we define with a signature. And because the signature is constant, C Sharp knows that it can call it with some um, input data and that it's going to return some kind of output data, all right? We haven't seen delegates also, I think, in this channel yet. Hopefully, we will do that at some point. If we've done it, there might be a card popping up in the corner. Otherwise, please be patient until we record that video. But for the sake of time, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to define that delegate. I'm going to declare it on the fly. I'm going to say delegate, and that delegate is going to be something that is going to take this, um, is, go is going to be a function that is going to execute inside of itself is going to call expire solution, right? And then just something I need to cast this to a function that takes nothing as an input and returns nothing as an output. So that would be an action with no types in it, all right? I know this might be a little weird to read or to understand, but hopefully when I record delegates and action functions, um, I can explain that better again. Maybe there's a card popping up. Maybe there isn't yet. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right, beautiful. What that will do is that this will de facto make the component that we are living in update itself entirely again. So it will go again and do an, and request an expiration. It will do a solve instance. It will do the whole thing, okay? Because it will do both the expiration and solving the instance, we need to modify those two functions to make sure that they work the way we want. So expire downstream after we invoke this expiration of the solution, because we have changed should expire to true. At this point, because this is going to be true, it's going to expire downstream objects, which is what we want. Okay, so in that sense, we're good. However, here, if we go to solve instance, what may happen is that because solve instance is going to be called again, what will happen is that we're going to capture the input again. We're going to uh, go for another update. This is going to run again. This is going to be updated again. There's going to be another expiration there. We would enter this infinite cycle of expiration solutions, expiration solutions, and we don't want that. So what we want to do is we want to say, because we know that solve instance is going to be called a second time. We know that that second time that is going to be called is when we have flagged should expire to be true. What that means is that this is that we need to capture that and we need to say if should expire equals true, it means this is the second, this is the second time solve instance was invoked. All right. If it is the second time, this time, we don't want to do the calculation. We already did the calculation. And we the result of that calculation is in this variable called message. So what we want to do is, if it's the second time, no calculation is to be done. Just set the data, set the output to that message that we had already pre-computed before and that we have in a variable here, all right? Just do that. And then make sure that we stop expiring things that we go back to the initial state. So we don't want to expire anything unless we perform a calculation and stop, stop running anything else in this component. All right. If that happens, then the second time that show instance is executed, this gets turned on. We output the result of the previous calculation. We set this back to false so that the next time we move the slider, we don't expire right away and we stop executing. So we don't read the input, we don't read the input and we don't perform any other calculations. Let's see if this works, okay? 
Let's take a look at that. I'm excited about this. Okay, and I'm not getting any errors, it looks. And Grasshopper is a little frozen because it's apparently, I think that file is quite big at this point, all right? And you can see that already we have something, we have one solution that was computed, all right? So let me move this slider a bunch of, so I'm going to go through several values. And I want you to notice how the solutions are probably going to start showing up one at a time. So I'm going to do this and this and this and this and this. And you see how two, 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 right? And if you actually notice, this was actually not blocking the thread. So it's not as slow as this one. Maybe I should, uh, but if I do this, you can see that I can still move and solutions were still being generated and we're not getting any empty solutions. So I'm going to say, hooray, it works, <laughs> which is great. Let me, let's do a comparison with the speckle approach. So how does a speckle? So I'm going to clean up both and I'm going to have this one here and the second one over here. Let's, let's, com let's compare how both of them right now work. So I'm going to go through several solutions. All right, several numbers. And you can see that I'm getting all of them buffer one after the other. However, Speckle, it's even a little smarter. And it says, well, you know what? If you're changing the value before I finish computing, then I'm not even going to bother. I'm just going to cancel what I was doing and then go right away to the new solution, right? So this is a natural consequence of the way we have, we are not preventing those calculations from happening. We're not buffering anything. So what will happen is that any changes that we do will happen in the background, will take time to, will take time to execute, but they will all execute. So I guess this is a natural consequence and depending on your use case, depending on whether if you want all the changing solutions to be computed or only the one that is final and stable to be the one that goes through, I think that would probably be up entirely to you. So if you want all of the solutions, you probably want to go for the row approach like we did here. Or if we want only the very last one, you probably want to use the speckle template for, uh, for and let me actually use an actual proper speckle component. There you go, you know? Now much better, okay? And then, uh, and you probably want to go for that solution, all right? Beautiful. Um, I know this may have been a little push, but uh, we were basically trying to hack Grasshopper to do something that it doesn't want to do naturally, which is breaking the natural update cycle of components and expirations and downstreams. All right. So do this with caution is not how Grasshopper wants to work. You might get you into trouble if you have many of these happening at the same time, if you're launching too many threads in the background, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and use the row approach or the speckle one, depending on your needs and depending on how much you want to actually take care of all of this, all right? Something that we haven't done in this video is what I actually like a lot about the speckle approach is that it has this very nice message that is giving us feedback about what is happening inside the component. So I may record after this video, another video where I show you how to display messages in Grasshopper components, which is actually a very simple thing to do. All right. So let's go and record that video right now. And in the meantime, if you like this video, you may want to consider liking the video, subscribing to the channel, saying hi, joining Discord, pinging me on Twitter, Instagram, whatever, whatever you want to do. All right. Thank you very much and see you in the next video. Bye bye. All right. I'm going to do this. And I'm going to now record uh, the introduction. Okay. And I'm going to save this actually. Yep, you go. I'm going to save it.
Hello, this is Jose Luis here at Parametric Camp and welcome to another video in our advanced development playlist where I would like to show you now. If you remember from the last video in this series, I was teaching you how to create asynchronous components, components that do not block Grasshopper if they have a very heavy operation. And I showed you how to do that using a template for asynchronous components that the folks at Speckle Systems had open source for all of us, which is very, very nice. However, I was actually interested in digging down what that template is doing. And in this video, what I would like to teach you is how to actually do this very same trick, the idea of a component that only updates after a long, heavy asynchronous operation has been completed. Uh, I would like to teach you how to do that from scratch. And it will be a very interesting excuse to also break down and understand a little better how the Grasshopper engine deals with update cycles in Grasshopper components. So a demonstration of what we're going to do is that here on the top, uh, I have, uh, I'm actually going to do this. On the left hand side, I have the speckle component that does a very heavy for loop operation. And on the bottom, I have the one that I have implemented raw by hand without the template. And you can see that if I now navigate through a bunch of different input values, what you can see is that this component is giving me in an asynchronous way, in a threaded way, is giving me all of those results, but it's not blocking Grasshopper at all. Whereas the speckle one is still calculating. But if I am changing those values while speckle is still computing, it will only give me the last result, okay? So it's a little bit of a difference between the two approaches that we have done. And again, at any rate, the interest of this video is both doing this by hand, but at the same time, trying to understand a little better the general architecture of update cycles in Grasshopper, okay? So if you have not seen the previous video where we implemented Speckle, there will be a card popping up somewhere in the, in the corner over there. And otherwise, just check, look for that video on the playlist, Advanced Development in Grasshopper. All right, let's dive in. All right, bio break, I will be right back one minute. Okay, I'm back. All right, so let's do now the other video where, where we, the next video where we're going to do how to add messages to, and for that, I'm actually going to start the video by discussing the problem. Timothy, hi Timothy, how are you doing? All right. Okay, so we're gonna start here.
Ooh, let me respond to this. Um, okay. Let's do this. All right. <clears throat> Hello, this is Jose Luis here at Parametric Camp and welcome to another video in this series, Advanced Development in Grasshopper. If you remember from the previous video, card popping up in the corner, uh, we implemented a custom component that does asynchronous operations and defers the expiration of the solution until that calculation is complete, all right? We did that inspired by the work from the Speckle Systems team, which had done a very similar example with a template that they open source. However, one thing that I really like about the Speckle approach is that it gives us feedback about what's happening during the component, whereas the component that we just did, we don't know if it's calculating, if it's not, what's going on. So what I want to do is I want to implement this kind of tiny message in the component that tells us if the component is calculating, if the component is done, etc., etc. So this is going to be a video where I'm basically going to show you how to display messages in your Grasshopper components, which is the easiest thing to do in this planet, by the way. So let me show you how to do that. Um, if you remember from the previous video, we had these uh, two tiered system of solutions where if the first, if it was the first time that we were computing the solution, we run an asynchronous solution, right? And if it was the second time, we output the solution through the component, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to have a model message that is going to have two states. Either it's going to be calculating, or either is going to be complete, uh, depending on where we stand solution-wise, all right? So the way we can do that is that if it is the first time that we're making the calculation, so what I can do is I can say from this component, there is a property called message that will take any string and will just add it as this tiny banner underneath. So if this is, if we're calculating, so what I'm going to do is this dot message is going to be equal to computing. All right, dot, dot, dot. Okay, and if we have completed doing the calculation, I'm just going to say did this dot message equals, um, um, what is it going to be, done. All right, literally, that's it. <laughs> you want to take a look at how that works? Let's open our files and see uh, and see how that works. And there you go. So we are here, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change and you see computing, 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 and then when it's done, pop, it pops up, done, you know? Pop, pop, changing, 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 pop, pop, pop. And of course, we could get more sophisticated. Speckle has this system for all, giving you like a sense of the progress, et cetera, et cetera. That can, that works when we know how much computation we have to do. It doesn't really work if we have a process where we don't know where we are in part of the process. For example, if we're doing an asynchronous request to some API service, we don't know when the service is going to respond. So, but as you can see, it's like very, very simple to implement. All right. So computing, woohoo, so that, this works. <laughs> all right. So that was it literally for this video. Thank you very much for watching. Hope to see you on more videos in this playlist. And if you like what you saw and if you found it helpful, tell your friends, bring them over to Parametric Camp, show them more videos, like this video, subscribe to the channel, you know, all that stuff. All right. Thank you very much and see you on the next video. Bye bye. All right.
That's, that was probably the easiest video I've recorded in <laughs> probably since I started this channel, I think. <laughs> All right, so we're going to be done with this. This, let me then um, push those changes to the repo. So that's going to be, we're going to be here. So you know that I'm a command line git person. So git status, and you can see that all these files have changed, right? So git add all git commit. And then I'm going to say, what was this? Async component from scratch. All right, and then we're going to push and that's it. And I'm not going to bother right now republishing the plugin, etc., etc. I don't think, uh, uh, yeah, I really want to record the other video with the post request. Okay. All right. So that's that. So what's next? So we don't need this anymore. We probably don't need this anymore. Correct. Yes, I'm not going to do that anymore. So um, And this is going to be here. And we do have a sync is using a sync component string process worker instance, etc, etc. We don't want that. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. You're not seeing. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I, <laughs> I get, I get. Uh, so in the sample files that we were tinkering with in the past. So where are we? Okay. So parametric camp, GitHub. So this would be the brain plugin. And for the brain plugin, what do we have right now? In the git status, where are we? I modified some nodes. Okay, git commit updated notes. Okay, we're going to push this. And then what I want to do is I want to remove anything that we don't need right now. So all the speckle async. I probably want to say in the video that we did an asynchronous version with speckle. And I probably want to point to the live stream where we did that. But I don't want to do that right now. And then this one, the callback is the one that we're actually interested in. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to disconnect from the my no, I'm going to leave it there. So instance. Uh, what do we have? We have post request component. This post request, we have this one, all of that. And what we have here is that something. Oh no, this is the asynchronous one. We want the callback one. Uh, the callback one. to wrap this into a post request. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just trying to establish in my head, how are we going to tell the story here and where we were video wise. I got it, ChatGPT answer, and a synchronous request allows the application to continue executing other code while waiting for it has to complete. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, that is an asynchronous. Very good. Good, good job, ChatGPT. <laughs> uh, 
and we have the component, the actual working one. Okay. And the one. Hmm. So the first thing we will need to do is we will need to take the inputs. Expire downstream. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to try handle, try. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this for brain, what do we have? If I run this, do we have a, a, a grasshopper file? with samples? I hope so, right? No, it doesn't look like we're running any testing workbench. Why do we not have that? HTTP post request component? Why? What? We don't have that? Why don't we have that? Uh, why don't we have that? But we do have the brain component, no? Here, brain, HTTP post request. So I guess this is an older version. Maybe I have changed the name. Maybe that's what it is. Save state, clean canvas, all right. Maybe I changed some parameters, I forget. So perform the request, the URL for completions, the body of the request, content. Do I have the token? Yes. The authorization, <clears throat> application JSON, timeout. Okay, and then we plug this in here. And is this working? Yeah, and it's blocked. Yeah, and we did get the result. All right. Okay. We need to make a get environment variable component. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what will we do now? In order to start the video, what I can probably do is we have the sample file. We have, <clears throat> I probably don't want this. Yes, I don't want this. So I'm going to save this. I'm going to close here, close here. And I, why do I not have some kind of, um, <clears throat> CR show. Yeah, I'm not, why am I not starting this with some arguments? So let me fix that actually. So in this one, what I have is start arguments, open, rhino, blah, 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 all of that. So here, start arguments, rhino, grasshopper, and then call. What are we going to call? We're going to call test. We're going to copy this path. All of this is going to go there. And yes. So that should work, hopefully. And then... Mm -hmm. We're going to delete this. We're going to delete this as well. We're going to delete the whole thing here. We're going to delete all this stuff here. Yes. 
and we're going to stick to the only right okay and then here we're going to git status git add everything git status git commit remove async test files we're going to push that <clears throat> okay and then the video is going to start from here and then <clears throat> And then before, I will have to record the introduction, but the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to create a component that is an HTTP post request asynchronous. I'm going to copy all this stuff. And then, I'm going to move things around. So actually, I'm going to do that offline. I'm going to do that offline, and I'm going to HTTP post request request a sync component and then I'm just going to copy paste everything literally base here base here HTTP post re post request post request and and this is post asynchronous it's synchronous, create a generic HTTP post request, asynchronous. All right. And then here we're going to copy everything for the inputs. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to do this offline, really, because this is kind of boring. Um, and then we're going to copy everything. And what we're going to do eventually is that we're going to move that into a we're going to move that eventually to a and we're going to add everything that is missing here system text etc and stream reader systems io all right so we now have a request component is synchronous. Okay. So we do have the same code, basically. Very good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then after the intro, what I would do is I would start here the video by saying, uh, there's a way to do this with a speckle template um, and I actually have a live stream where I tried it out. If you want to check it out, just go to the live stream, but otherwise we're going to try to do this. And then the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take all the post logic to its own, to its own, the post logic to its own, um, to its own, uh, I will, I'm going to say this, hopefully to its own logic. To its own function, exactly, yes. All right. I have a very strong Friday syndrome, I think. <laughs> I need to take a break. Um, okay, let's just record this video and then we're, we, can, we, can, we, can, we can take off for Friday, okay. <clears throat> Fantastic. If you remember, in previous videos, we had discussed how we can develop a synchronous components by using a template that was developed by the Speckle Systems Group. And if you want to learn more about that, you can go to the link on the card that is going to pop out in the corner. Uh, but we also recorded in our Advanced Development in Grasshopper playlist, we also recorded another video where we discuss how we can do that manually on our own without using that template. There will be another card <laughs> popping up with that video here in the corner. And so what I would like to do is 
I would like to apply that technique, the idea of having a process in the background, um, um, process in the background, starting over again, starting over again. Fantastic. So first things first, if you remember, I had, we have recorded in previous videos uh, how to perform a synchronous tasks in Grasshopper components with the help of the speckle system template for Grasshopper that they published and they open sourced a while ago. I actually tried how to do that with this uh, HTTP post request. So if you want to check that video there, I did it in a live stream uh, and the card to that live stream should be popping somewhere in the corner. And we also have a video in the advanced development playlist where we discuss how uh, to do this systematically for other components. In that same playlist, I also recorded this one video where I explain how to perform this same functionality in a synchronous task that defers the expiration of a component and schedules a solution whenever the asynchronous task has finished executing. Uh, and I explain how to do that manually also as a way to understanding a little better how the update cycle of Grasshopper components work. If you want to learn more, it would definitely be super helpful for you to understand this video. So please go to this card that is popping up in the corner where you can learn how to implement asynchronous components with custom expiration from scratch, all right? Which is the baseline of the technique that I'm going to be using for this video, okay? So please, please check that video in order to understand what I'm going to be doing for this one, okay? So the way I have started is that I have created a new component in my plugin. I'm calling it HTTP post request asynchronous, all right? And for starters, I've created a simple Grasshopper component and I have copy pasted everything that we did for the non, for the synchronous version, for the blocking version, okay? We have the exact same inputs, we have the exact same output parameters, and right now we have the exact same solver instance, all right? So the first thing that we're going to do is, because I want the post request to happen in an asynchronous way, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that, all the code for the post request, and I'm going to take it somewhere else, and I'm going to wrap it, I'm going to wrap it inside of a task so that that task can run on a separate thread and it doesn't block the execution of Grasshopper. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to basically go ahead and create some kind of private function here, and I'm going to let me do this here. I'm going to zoom in and I'm going to create a private function uh, that is going to return nothing and I'm going to call this asynchronous post, all right? And this is going to take a bunch of, um, a bunch of information. The information that it's going to take is basically going to be everything that we need in order to customize a particular post request. That's going to be the body, the content type, the authorization, the timeout, and also probably, I'm forgetting about this, the URL. You see, uh, the autocomplete is probably smarter than me at this point, okay? So we're going to do that, and I'm going to now take all the code that we needed for the actual post request, which probably starts here, and goes all the way down here until all the way up here, all right? I'm going to take it away from here and I'm going to paste it back in here, all right? So I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to paste it here, and you see that I have some, a few things that I need to uh, figure out. So actually, a couple of things that I'm going to do, because I do have a try-catch block, I'm actually going to move everything into this try-catch block just to make sure Oh, sorry, just to make sure that if anything goes wrong, it will not crash Grasshopper and it will not give me errors. I think I need to replace auth token and auth token with the name of authorization, which is what I called in here, right? And so right now I have a function that given the URL, the body, the content, the authorization, and the timeout will create this uh, post request and we'll store the response into this variable that I have here, okay? However, nothing of what I've done yet is asynchronous. The way I'm going to turn this request into asynchronous is by wrapping it into a task.run. 
task.run is basically in C Sharp a way of saying, I want to start a new task. It's going to run on a separate thread. It's going to be moved to the background, right? And in that thread, I would like to execute the one function that I'm going to define right now. You can define it as a separate function or you can, um, or you can define a, what's called an anonymous function. So a function that I define on the fly without a name. I'm just going to do that for the sake of speed here. So the way I do that is by saying this function is going to take no arguments and it's going to execute this block here. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all of this, the code for the request, all right? And I'm going to put it inside of the inside of here, all right? Beautiful. So something that I would like to get rid of is this add run time message because since I am in a different thread, I will not be able to uh, execute that, but that's for reasons that I do not want to really get into right now, okay? So, and then here, what I would like to say instead, instead if I get an error, I just want the response to be this, this error, the message that is part of the exception that I'm getting, all right? Beautiful. So what are, what's going to happen now? If you remember in the previous video what I was saying, what I was saying in the previous video, what I was doing asynchronous calculations in Grasshopper components, what I explained is that in order to be able to output data from an asynchronous task, the asynchronous task is running, is running on a different scope in Grasshopper. So in order to basically store the result of that calculation, in this case, the response that we get from the post request and make it permanent so that it can be accessed by different threads, what I would probably want to do is I would probably want to turn that into a global variable that lives in the scope of the class of the component that I am developing. So I'm going to say here, private string underscore response is going to be empty for the time being, right? And then what I'm going to do here is that instead of defining that variable here, what I'm going to say is whenever the response is done, save it in this global variable that is accessible to any thread, any function, any operation that is living in my component. And here, when the output, I'm going to output that response, all right? Beautiful. So right now, what we have is, this is not working yet the way we want, but what we have is a solution that whenever it's executed, it runs through all the inputs, it gathers those inputs, and it launches an asynchronous post request with the URL, the blah, 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 and the blah, 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 right? And then it outputs the response. We need to understand though, I'm going to run this. We need to understand though, that this is not gonna work yet because since this request is asynchronous, what's going to happen is that when sol solve instance executes, this asynchronous post request is going to be launched but because it's asynchronous and it goes to a background thread, the system is going to go and immediately execute the set the data output way, way before the actual post request has been resolved. What that means is that the first time we run this, the response is going to be an empty string, right? And then the message will get, let me show you what that's going to look like. So, oh, so I don't know, some, error there. So here, so we have brain, what is brain? Brain is here, utilities, HTTP post asynchronous. So I'm going to create a new controller here, the URL, the body, the type is whatever it has by default, the authorization and the timeout. And let me just uh, show the full name so that it's a little clear. All right, beautiful. And I'm going to connect this here. And I'm also going to connect this somewhere here so that I can see the full response, all right? So what's going to happen? I'm going to turn the asynchronous one on. I'm going to turn it on. You can see that my component, it's still working. My grasshopper is still running, correct? However, I this is probably executing and probably I did get some response back from uh, OpenAI. It's just that because I output the result right away, oh boy, and I'm getting some fat errors here because I output the response right away, 
it was empty at the time. So now I don't get, and if I press false, I also output an empty. So this is like starting to work, but it's not quite there yet. So how can I solve this? So if you remember from the video where I was explaining a asynchronous tasks inside of Grasshopper components and when I was explaining the expiration cycle of, cycle of Grasshopper components, please go to the card in the corner to refresh uh, what I did in that video. What we did was we had this system where we made sure, this is the diagram that I did for that video, we made sure that we control when expiration happened, what expiration messages we were sending back downstream to any components that depended on this, and we only expired this solution whenever the result of any heavy calculation, in this case, the post request, whenever the result of this was already computed, we trigger a new solution, all right? So let me show you how we're going to do that here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to first, I'm going to create a global variable that's going to be a Boolean variable that I'm going to call should expire. And that's going to start as false, all right? The second thing that I'm going to do is that I'm going to override a, um, a function that Grasshopper components have which is called um, override, what is it called? Expire downstream objects, okay? And what I'm going to do is that I'm only going to call the base behavior if should expire equals true, all right? What that means is that only if should expire is true will we flag everything that is downstream as needing an update, okay? So that's the second thing that we're going to do. The third thing that we're going to do is that whenever the request has finished calculating, what we're going to do is that we're going to require for the component to update itself again, automatically. We're going to say, you're done with the post request, you got everything you need, okay, then trigger yourself an update automatically. As if, as if, as, just as if we turn it off and on in, in a way, right? In the previous video, I explained how we can do that by catching the thread that is running the Rhino UI. And we're doing that because since we have an asynchronous task running on a separate thread, uh, we have thread problems, so we need to catch that thread. And then we need to execute on that thread in an action function that is wrapping a delegate. And I explained also, I actually didn't quite explain that in the other video, but what we want to basically say is that in that thread, I want to execute this function called expire solution with the value of true so that everything downstream is recalculated, okay? And I'm going to do the same even if I get an error, all right? Beautiful. Um, okay, so then in that case, what I would like to do now is the last thing that I would like to do is if there was a solution that was scheduled or if, if, if we receive the post request and my component updates again, what it's going to do is that it's going to expire downstream because now at this point, this is going to be equal to true. Did I say that? I did not say that. That is also okay. So I forgot to do that. So whenever we get a solution, we need to make sure that we change this to true. And also here, we change this to true, all right? And then, which actually probably the, these two could be uh, somewhere here after, I don't know. Anyway, this is, so we expire the solution. The solution gets expired again. The first thing that gets called is expired downstream because this is true now. We're going to flag everything downstream as needing an update. And then the second thing is this will be executed again. But what we won't want to do is we don't want to now again take all the inputs, figure them out, launch another post request because we will get trapped in this infinite cycle of update, post request, update, post request, etc. So what we want to do is if this gets called a second time and this time we did have an expiration that we wanted to do, at this point, what we want to do is we want to take that data that we stored after the post request and we want to send it as part of the output, all right? And then after we do that, 
what we probably want to do is we want to say, you know what, do not expire again and stop doing anything that you want and stop any, doing anything beyond this line of code. So do not continue to create another real calculation, another post request, etc., etc. None of that. All right. Are we ready to give this a try? Let's give this a try. So I'm going to run the plugin. I'm going to open this work file that I have with um, the components that I'm developing and let's see how that works. So where is Grasshopper? It's my other window. So right now I have the asynchronous request. So I'm going to turn true. It's executing. It's not blocking, etc., etc. And let's cross fingers. Am I getting a result? Come on, come on, please, please, please. Yes. Well, I didn't get it <laughs> because the expiration timed out. But what if I reduce the tokens here? So if I let me turn this to false. But you saw how I did get a response after the fact, right? Uh, over time. So let's say that this is 16 tokens, which is going to make the operation much lighter. Okay, true. And then boom, I get the result. And did you see how it took like a few seconds, but I was, it was not blocking? Hooray! So this is working <laughs> as we expected. Okay, beautiful. Fantastic. I really like this. I like when things, um, I like when plans work well. Well, what was the A team uh, phrase, right? Now, this is working, but the last thing that I would like to do is that I think from a UI perspective, especially if we are not blocking Grasshopper, people might be confused about, is this working? Is this not working? Is it doing anything? So giving people feedback is typically a very good thing from a UI UX standpoint. People knowing what is going on under the hood is always a good thing from, from, as a designer, right? So what I would like to do is I would like to implement some kind of message here, like the speckle systems template had, where we're going to be giving feedback to the user about which stage is the component at any given point at, all right? So let me think about a nice way of doing that. Doors, thank you. Thank you for your kind words. Very happy that you like the content. <laughs> all right. Okay, so this is going to be false. I'm going to save this. Okay. <clears throat> mm -hmm. okay, how are we going to do this? Oh, I need to wrap up. I need, I'm going to need to go very soon. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Okay, because this video is perhaps for the for the for those of you who are a bit more on the advanced development side, I would like to make it in a slightly more sophisticated way. All right. So what I would like to do is I would like to imagine all the different states at which this component can be. For example, it can be idle. So it can be not do, just not doing anything right now. It can be waiting for a response. It can be completed. So it may have received a response and it's already showing the response. It, it might have some kind of error. So uh, something went wrong with the request, right? Or it might be off. So someone turn it off. It's just not working. It's not doing anything, right? So what I would like to do is I would like to first define what are those possible discrete states 
right? And then I would like to, depending on where we are component-wise in the, that stage of the solution, I would like to present messages based on that, uh, those different states. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add here a new item and it's going to be a simple class. And I'm going to call this uh, request state enumerator, all right? And what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to say, instead of a class, what I'm going to define here is an enumerator that I'm going to call request state, all right? And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to define all the different possible states that we can have. I believe we've talked about enumerators already in this channel. If we have, there will be a card popping up in the corner. So it's going to be the request can be off, the request can be idle, the request can be requesting or waiting, however you want to call it, the request can be done, or the request can have must, might have yield an error, right? And enumerators are useful because referring to these things by name is actually much nicer from a development standpoint than referring to them by number, all right? And then here, I'm going to define a private variable that I'm going to, this is going to be of the type request state, which is going to be current state. And I think we're going to initialize this to the value of off, all right? Beautiful. So then what I would like to do is, first of all, I need to manage in every scenario, what kind of state are we at, all right? So for example, let's say that whenever we have finished a, some computer, now, let's do it the other way around. So we're here, right? So we, it's the first time we update. So what we do is, if this is not active, if the input of for send is false, then what we want to do is we want to say the current state is going to be equal to request state dot off, all right? So we set that as the state of which we are. And then we want to then schedule a new solution. So what we want to say is should expire, should, what are we doing? Should expire equals true, all right? And then we want to force that expiration. So in this case, we don't need to do the delegate. We can just call expire solution because we are on the same thread as the UI, right? And then we finish executing. And that what we will do, what I will do is that it will schedule a new solution which will hit this point, and then at this point, we will handle what to do if it's off, if it's idle, if it's not, etc., etc. Otherwise, we go on, we fetch the inputs, and if any of these is not working, then what we can do is we can say, well, here, uh, let me say, uh, if, if the URL was not valid, then current state, sorry, current state is going to be equal, oh my God, Current state is going to be equal to ever, all right? And for this one, um, for this one also is going to be equal to ever, and I'm going to also expire the solutions, all right? So this expires, and this one expires, correct? Beautiful. If this goes through, then at this point, Current state is going to be equal to uh, requesting, right? And maybe at this point is not a bad point. It's not a bad moment to give some feedback. So we want to say this dot message. So, uh, and we want to write requesting so that we are giving some feedback to the user that the request actually started going through. All right. Then let's keep going. What we're going to do now is we have the response and then the response when the response was successful what we want to do here is we want to say damn it current state is going to be equal to request state dot done so we're finished this one was a good request however if we are at the error what we want to say is that this was not done this was this yielded an error all right and the response is whatever here and last but not least, so now when we go back here during solve instance, we say, this is the second time we update the solution. We have, depending on what may have happened, we have flagged the state as an error, 
as requesting, as done, as error, etc., etc. So what I would like to do is that here is going to be the place where we're always going to end up landing after anything happens. So here I would like to have a comprehensive breakdown of all the possible if else, if else, all the possible different states that may have been uh, the result of the previous calculation. And then I need to handle this and get feedback here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I'm going to switch based on current state. All right, and I'm going to handle each particular case. So for example, if the case is that the request that, that uh, if the case is for request state of, all right, so what is that going to be like? Otherwise, if case is request dot idle, what does that look like? And I'm going to fill in the, so case request dot requesting, and what is that going to look like? Case request dot error, and what is that going to look like? And then case request dot, oof, done. All right, and what is that going to look like? Those are all the possible options. So if the request state is off, I'm going to write a message and it's going to say message is going to be equal to inactive. I'm not doing anything then the data that I want to output is going to be just an empty string and uh, current state is going to go back to nothing. All right, it's going to go back to uh, idle. It's going to go back to idle, exactly. So if we are idle, then um, I don't know, um, probably idle. <laughs> I actually don't think that we can be here in this case. But anyway, so for requesting, we already handled this requesting blah, 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 and no empty string. And this is going to be. Uh, and then for error, actually, I don't think this should be here. And I also don't think that idle should be here. And error for error, we're going to see error. And now I'm going to uppercase this actually. And then we're going to, um, what are we going to do? What we're going to do is that if we get an error, the response, exactly. If we get an error, the response is going to be saved as the response. So, and if we do that here, we're going to replace this with this. So instead of adding a runtime message, we're just going to save that error message in the response. Okay. And then if we get an error, what we, what we want to do is now we're going to add a runtime message, which is going to be at the level of error, and it's going to use the response as a message. All right, the data, we're not going to output anything so that it outputs a null. All right, and then we're going to go back to idle. And then if we're done, which is hopefully where we want to be most of the time, what we're going to do is we're going to say the message is complete. And then set data is going to be the response. And we're going to go back to the state of idle. All right. That was a lot. But let's see if that works. Okay. So what should happen now is that we should get different messages based on, for example, let's say. So you see right now we have an inactive, which is great because it's false, right? So if I turn this to true, what we should get is requesting and then done. Correct. So that's going to be requesting. And then whenever this is done, boom, we get a complete message and then here. And then if I turn this back, it goes to inactive. Let's see if we can get an error. So I'm going to add here some something, right? And then I'm going to turn this on requesting and you see we get an error, we pop up a message, the return, we got an authorized and we also got the message right here. Okay, which I kind of like. So we go back to inactive. Yes. So this is working already the way I want. And if I turn it on, oh, I still got an error. Uh, am I still not better? Oh, I need a white space here. Yes, exactly. I need a white space requesting and blah, blah, blah. All right. 
Beautiful. I think this works. I think this is what I want it to be. So I do like this idea that the component is giving us feedback. I wonder if in future videos, um, because most components are going to be doing some kind of HTTP request, we're going to have to copy paste this all the time. Or I wonder if we can wrap all of this into some kind of structure that is common for all the components. I'm going to think about that. Um, and if we do that, then you will probably see a video of that at some point in the future. Okay. Beautiful. So I think that was it for this video. Thank you very much. If you liked it, press the button, say hi, join Discord, <laughs> do sound effects, pressing buttons like I'm doing, I don't know, whatever you do to have fun. Okay. Thanks a lot and see you on the next videos in this playlist developing a plugin for machine learning APIs in Grasshopper. Bye bye. All righty. So now I think to rec I need to record the introduction, which I always forget. Okay, so let's do that. Mm -hmm. And where am I? Okay, and I want to zoom in because when I, when I then put the, um, then I can't see things and it's not great. So I'm going to do this here so that the banner and the cover letter and the cover of the video then goes all the way up here. Timothy, happy you like it. Have we met before? Um, have you been in the channel? If not, welcome to say hi, join the Discord, etc., etc. All right. Re introduction to the video. Hello, this is Jose Luis here at Parametric Camp and welcome to another video in this playlist called Developing a Machine Learning Plugin for uh, Machine Learning APIs in Grasshopper, the Brain Plugin. I don't know yet. I still have to figure that out. Anyway, in the previous video, you saw how we develop a generic component for HTTP POST requests. But if you remember, whenever I turn it on, my grasshopper gets frozen because it's a very heavy operation, right? So what I have done, what I would like to teach you in this video is how to create a similar version, identical in functionality, but the only thing that it changes is that in this case, this one is going to be asynchronous, which means that when I turn this on, I can still react and interact with the grasshopper, but uh, this operation goes into a background thread, it operates and whenever the background thread is ready, it triggers an update in the component with the solution for that request, okay? And we have added like a couple of nifty tricks here also to give us like a sense of is there an error? Uh, so for example, if I add some jibber jabber here, we get an error, etc. It goes inactive. So it's, a, it, it's like it's nice because from a design standpoint, from a UI UX standpoint, we're giving the user feedback about what's going on in this um, in this component that is like executing in the background. Okay. So this will be very useful if you want to implement asynchronous components yourself. And it's also useful to understand how whenever we create code that is interacting with the internet and is pinging APIs on the server, it's much better to work, do it in an asynchronous way because we don't block, uh, our software, which is typically a very frustrating experience. So let's take a look at how did we do that. Oh boy, that was a lot. Three videos. What? That's kind of a uh, pretty good. Um, notwithstanding the fact that one of the videos was two minutes long. <laughs> that was kind of an easy one that I stuck in there. Right. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it's not about duration, it's about quality, you know? <laughs> anyway, I think that's going to be it. I need to go to school. I have meetings this afternoon. I have thesis presentations. I want to hang out a little bit with... Uh, uh, I, I, 
Ah, are you team designs? Is that who you are, Timothy? Huh. Maybe, yeah. I've, of course, I've seen you. Uh, team designs. Is that who you are? Anyway, folks, I'm going to have to go. I can't hang out today uh, uh, for long. Very good to see you all. Um, and uh, I will be here. Am I here next week? Let me check because I probably have something going on, right? Another doctor's appointment. Oh, well, well, it looks like I have nothing next week. So I think next week we will go back to our regular time, regular streaming, etc., etc. Okay, thank you very much and see you everyone. Bye-bye.